Alright, welcome to the Young APA Podcast, I'm James, this is Pete. G'day everyone. It is episode 152, it is April 2nd, but who the hell knows what day it is anymore. I think it's a Thursday? I hope so. Anyway, uh, we have a fun show for you guys coming up. We're going to be talking to Boston Edwards, the IPA campus coordinator from the University of Wollongong. We are going to be talking the wage stimulus package. We're going to be talking, uh, we've got all our heroes and villains. Peace really looking forward to, what was it again? Uh, I'm looking forward to those two brothers from New York whose names I can't pronounce having a huge tiff on CNN, the journalist and the governor of the whole joint. I have told you how to pronounce it at least six times, so give us your best get bear on how uh, it is pronounced. Kuomo. <laughs> yeah, Kuomo you, got it, you got it. No, well really, done. that's well it. Done. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think that's how you've been uh, saying it. Yeah, no, it's Kuomo. Uh, and then uh, oh, we've well, also got like okay. uh, the World Health, no. Health Organization is getting into stuff. But it, anyway, let's start off with the thing that everyone's talking about at the moment, which is the government's wage subsidy program and all the debt it has created slash, uh, you know, all the other issues that are involved. So Pete, talk us through it. Exactly right. So obviously the biggest story of coronavirus at the moment in Australia is the uh, wage subsidy program that the, uh, the government has introduced. But businesses will receive a fortnightly wage subsidy of up to 1500 bucks per employee. Uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said he expected 6 million Australians uh, would access a so-called JobKeeper payment for the next six months. And the government also doubled the JobSeeker payment, previously called New Start. Now, uh, obviously, at the IPA, you know, we don't like big government sim- stimulus packages. We, we do prefer the wage subsidy over welfare because you keep people in a job. Uh, the people retain the dignity of work and the connection to their workplace. But there is an issue with how much debt we are racking up. In three years, our debt is going to be a trillion dollars uh, is the estimate. That's, that's a lot of money. That's more than, uh, more than I can afford, James, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> John Roskam, John Roskam our big, the big cheese here at the IPA said that, uh, what did he say? Just trying to find my spot here. He said, business as usual never will, means we will never pay back our debt. So unless we become more productive in the next 10 years, we will not be able to pay back this debt. And that's the kind of thing we have to keep talking about because we would never be in a situation this bad had we been more productive over the last 15 years. And we will definitely have to become more productive in the next 10 years to deal with this trillion dollar debt. Yeah, so my thing is, uh, I said it last week on the show, I prefer wage subsidies so much over the, like, uh, let the layoffs happen and then increase new start. Because, you know, there's economic uh, arguments to be made, but, and if I may go on a moral one or maybe like a psychological one, it is just so much more important for me that all the people that have lost their jobs or all the people that are suffering or all the people that are like, you know, worried about their futures right now, at least they can sit there and think there's, you know, like they're more likely to have a job to go back to than they were four days ago now that these wage subsidies are in. Because things were being floated like it was going to be over a million people unemployed or maybe 12% unemployment. And... That is like heartbreaking, not only for the people involved, but just for the nation to just see the lines outside New Start and to see six months of unemployment figures like that. And, you know, it's something that we found at the IPA with research is the longer you are unemployed, the longer you continue to be unemployed. So you just think all the people that would spend six months without a job maybe and then don't have a job to go back to what happens to them for the next six months after that? Like maybe the crisis is over for the rest of us, but not for those people involved. So... Like, I, I like the wage subsidy program. I get the debt thing, but I like the wage subsidy side. Yes, exactly right. And, and when, once the dust settles on all this, we do have to have discussions about stuff that we spend money on, billions of dollars on renewable energy. You know, in five years' time, when someone says we should build a theme park honoring Greta Thunberg, that's the time we can ma- start to have those discussions about maybe if we spent a little bit less money. You know, we've got this crisis just in the back wind- windscreen mirror <laughs> uh, and we know what a real crisis looks like. We know that we have to have money for those w- when they come along. Yeah, that's the thing. So uh, when the story broke, there was like a pretty spirited discussion on the IPA Slack channels about it. And, you know, it was like that was the kind of thing where – when you when the our generation or maybe like our kids generation or grandparents generation the eventual generation that foots the bill for all the debt that australia is now in i mm. think when they look through how we got here they'll get the coronavirus spending that'll be okay but it's stuff like yeah 800 million dollars for the abc or all the money thrown at renewables or all the, the money rest. thrown at like yeah and scott cam like remember how much money <laughs> remember when scott cam was the number one issue in australia <laughs> can we go exactly. back to that? I- 
That was like three weeks ago. Has Scott, what's, no, he no. Done? what's his announcement been? Is he like giving up his wage? What's the story there? Uh, I think he made another social media post. So oh. you know, we're really getting a return on investment for those things. But uh, yep. that's the kind of thing that people will be looking at and just going like, what the hell was that all about? Why did we need that? Especially, you know, you talk about renewables and then nuclear and stuff like that. Uh, the last thing I want to say, uh, the one thing I go with is this 1500 per worker. Mm. Like what, where, where is that? coming from what do you mean because it seemed to be just like every worker it's fifteen hundred dollars like even if you were getting less than that even if you're getting paid more than that it's fifteen hundred dollars per worker well there's like, in other countries who, who, you go you go okay i'll go <laughs> okay i'll go oh, no! <laughs> this is the this is working from home for podcasting it's so difficult james you do your point right now go i i forgot it <laughs> no I, so fifteen hundred dollars for, for, for worker uh who, who gets... Is it the whole 1500 goes straight to the worker? Does the boss keep the stuff that he's not paying the worker? If it's $1,500 per worker guaranteed and you don't earn $1,500 a fortnight, isn't you, aren't you kind of rooting for your company to shut down so you get that $1,500? Like, I, I just don't get where the $1,500 mark came in. Yeah, all that stuff's a bit unclear from what I can tell. In other countries, they've done percentages, like 80% in New Zealand, I think, and 90% in Austria, which I know because my sister's there. But uh, yeah, I don't know where they got the fifteen hundred from, mate. You're asking the wrong person, and it is yeah. So if you earn less than fifteen hundred dollars, do you get the fifteen hundred dollars? Good question. Who knows? Yeah, probably. In the, so probably like someone does. Yeah, I, I guess my final point, like coming back to it, would be wage subsidy good. Fifteen hundred dollars slightly questionable, and debt. Uh, let's p- stop paying Scott Cam. Yeah, that's yeah. the solution. <laughs> okay, Scott cool. Cam. Uh, so the other thing, uh, so much to discuss with coronavirus, but. One thing that really caught uh, my eye this week was uh, just all the measures that the police are now taking across the country to crack down on people doing things that were completely lawful and good merely yeah. two weeks ago. So yeah. the number one piece of footage was uh, the Queensland police patrol cars going across public parks and you just mm. see someone sitting there reading a book and suddenly a police officer is standing over them saying... Uh, can you do this at home or whatever they're saying? But the idea, like they are practicing social distancing, they're by themselves, they're or they're in two people, which is also okay. But the police are literally driving around public parks, going what to do. Uh, then you also had Victoria. Now I know this got overturned, but Victoria said you can't visit your uh, partners if they don't live with you. Mm. I mean that lasted all of seven hours, but the fact that it was even floated, I'm just like, what the hell? Uh, yeah. But in Victoria, you still can't fish. You can't stand in the lake by yourself and fish. Really? That's not okay. Yeah, because it's a non-essential service. Uh, so you can't stand there by yourself in the middle of a lake and fish. That is now something you cannot be allowed to do because you're going to catch coronavirus from a fish. The other part, uh, and Western Australians who ignore self-isolating orders could be fitted with an electronic tracking device in a bid con- to contain the spread of COVID-19 in the state. Now, Pete, when did we get invaded by North Korea? Well, that's true, mate. That's a good point. Uh, And you can see a lot of this stuff creeping in. My thing about the police, right? So this person is sitting in a park by themselves 100 metres from the nearest soul. These police people have been interacting with random people all day and then they come up to someone who's isolated and go, move. The only chance they've got of getting this is you, mate. So why don't you just back off and, uh, you know, stop the spread, as they say. Stay home as well. But um, what, what was the other one? You said fishing. Yeah, I didn't know about that. I reckon there's a little bit with the with the love winds here in Victoria. I mean, who knew that Dan Andrews was such an old romantic? The old is dog. It love? I reckon there would. What's that? Sorry. Well, is it? Oh, are okay. We, are we really so that's the love? party you want to go down. Because if it was that's love, you'd be living together. This is a, so uh, this is more lust. <laughs> this is a family podcast, James. I'm not willing to speculate on that. I what I mean, I reckon there were a few pollies who were like, so does that mean I can't visit my mistress? Is that? Is that what this means? So maybe the, the pressure oh, from the party it. room. The, I, the I definitely thought it, but you said it on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I was and, like, how many uh, people How many people called up uh, politicians' offices yesterday outing themselves as cheaters? Yeah. Just like, or just are you telling me? Themselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so you can prescribe. Yeah, just, I'm, I'm giving you so many outs to go away from that, but you're like, nah, nah we're going oh, well, you know. I'll take the truth defense, but I have got one more point, James, just before we move on. And this is a broader point that goes beyond coronavirus. I don't like the word partner to describe your boyfriend or girlfriend. It makes it sound like someone you're going to go go out and face the new ball with or someone that you're going to uh, start the accounting firm with. <laughs> partner, stop saying partner. Say girlfriend or boyfriend. It's much nicer. That's, a, that's it. 
That's my uh, point. Yeah. Well, my other point is like, we are still Australians and Australians don't like rules at the best of times. And then when you start saying stuff like you can't go fishing by yourself, it, it, it's sort of the stuff that is so people are going to break it so quickly and so much and it's going to diminish everything else. Like, uh, you know, I'm sitting here, I say, if you can't stay home, do it and don't social distance and all that stuff. But if you start telling me like you can't sit in a park and read a book, I'm not going to listen to that. And then when you turn around and say, oh, and also keep 1.5 meters away from people when you can, I won't listen to that either because you're the same guy that told me I can't read a book in the park by myself. Do you read James? Uh, little flex. Sorry, I'm on a GoPro here at home. You can see a bookshelf, so oh, no. many a book. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of like Tiger Time and 2017 Premiership. There is a Tiger Not Time. Exactly, there's yeah. also Solzhenitsyn. So you got the good and the bad. <laughs> okay, so so that's great, James. I'm glad you've done that. What was I going to say? Oh, so I was going to say just this morning, New South Wales Police Commissioner Nick F- Mick Fuller said that this might go for 90 days. So that goes to your point. Like people are a big chance of not following this in 90 days' time. Uh, and then the other thing that we've got to talk about is that the, there is an alternate option to this, which is being tried out in Sweden, where they're, they're not enforcing strict quarantine laws. They're just sort of, uh, what's the word, suggesting that you do. So they're just guidelines at this stage. Only on Sunday did they bring in banning uh, gatherings of more than 50 people. So, oh, geez, I just banged my whole setup here. Um, so uh, what's, what am I saying? Yeah, so in Sweden... They're doing a, a, the middle road, really. They're not doing nothing, but they're not doing the, the onerous things that everyone else is doing. So we'll be able to tell, you know, in a few months' time when the dust settles, you know, the whole global economy is tanked and, you know, how Sweden went compared to everyone else. If they had exactly the same outcome with coronavirus, then you might say they were right. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, we're going to get into another country that's doing pretty well that we should be listening to, but the uh, World Health and Organization kind of wants us to forget about them. Uh, now, uh, sorry, who's doing... Queensland public sector. That's you. So, Pete, talk to us about the Queensland public sector. I was going to say, as far as I know, Queensland is still a part of Australia. But, yeah, no, we are going to do the Queensland public servants. Uh, Now, this is pretty extraordinary, James, because there's 224,000 state public servants in Queensland, and they are a big chance. They are set to receive pay rises. Pay rises, James, pay rises, totaling 3%. Workers across the state uh, are participating in a ballot on whether or not they'll accept the pay rise, plus a one-off cash payment of $1,250. Alex Scott, General Secretary of Together Queensland, which is the union that represents uh, the Queensland Public Service, said, our members are doing it tough financially. Well, not as tough as everyone else, Mr. Scott. Uh, The Commonwealth is looking at pump priming the economy because everyone is struggling and the public sector is more reliant on wage rises than they would normally be. It's like, oh, they're pump priming the economy, James. So let's just give the Queensland public servants a 3.3% pay rise. Do you know what? Why stop there? Why not double pay for everyone? In fact, the government should just uh, pay everyone a billion dollars because pump priming the economy. No, it's going to pump and prime the economy. Uh, so, well, that's very important. Uh, yeah, so... This is the thing that a lot of people at the IPA have been saying in the letters that people have been sending out to members and then in the media as well, which is the people that are saying lock down the economy, the people that are saying cafes, restaurants and bars need to shut down, uh, they're the people that are not going to feel the effects of what's about to happen. So if you're a Queensland public sector and your pay keeps on rising, obviously you're only really going to be guided by... uh, the health risks that are involved with people not social distancing. But everyone else has to sort of go, okay, we need to keep people safe, but also I need to keep providing food for my family. So they're the people I'd rather be listening to, the people that are are going to feel the effect either way and need some balance. Whereas if you're insulated from all the problems, you're only going to see the health side. You're not going to care about the economy. So this stuff pisses me off. Oh, it's just extraordinary that you can ask for a pay rise at this time and then sort of claim it somehow to somehow some kind of economic stimulus. Yeah, exactly. On, <laughs> it's mate. just we all need to be in it together. And yeah. that's the kind of stuff yeah. where people would go, they're not in it with me, they're well, looking after themselves. The the union's called Together Queensland, James. They're not living up to their name. And they and Scott Cam should have a long hard look at themselves. I was going to say, Scott Cam must be kicking himself. He went to the federal government, not the state of Queensland. For He could still be dining yeah. out, absolutely. He'd be on the hook for 3%. Yeah, so, all right, so last thing we need to discuss, uh, this came out just this morning. Bloomberg has a report from three intelligence officials from the White House that China was drastically under-reporting coronavirus cases. Oh, uh, shock. Duh. 
Uh, it's light on details, but according to the Mail on Sunday, which is a British paper, the British government is furious with China, accusing it of underreporting cases as well. The newspaper, which cited unnamed sources, said scientists told the UK Prime Minister that Boris, uh, Boris Johnson that China could have downplayed his number of confirmed cases uh, by a factor of 15 to 40 times. Now, I've been doing the thing where every time China reports the uh, new cases of coronavirus in the middle of this lockdown, I just add a zero to the end of whatever the number whatever number they give us just so i can sort of get an idea in my head uh creepiest one i saw was the uh the, these truck drivers have been talking to the press now these are truck drivers that are bringing urns into wuhan uh to, to families now the city's official death toll like the epicenter of the crisis where it broke out the city's official death toll is 2535 now one truck driver in wuhan delivered 5,000 urns to a single funeral home over two days last week according to the south china morning post now, Pete, I'm not a maths guy, all right? I'm not an accountant. I'm not a uh, nuclear physicist, if you will. What kind of guy are you? Uh, just his own guy, you know? <laughs> totally by this Sorry, point, everyone's got a sort of, sort of read on me. But if a truck driver is delivering 5,000 urns in two days to one funeral home, I start yeah. to think that the city's official death toll of 2,535 might not be right. Well, yeah, the whole country's only meant to have 3,300, so... You know, there you go, mate. Unless there was an absolute pile up on the uh, freeway, something's gone amiss. <laughs> no, it's an absolute disgrace, mate. Yeah, and, and so it's one of those things where uh, people talk about, oh, everyone, uh, Trump's being really mean to China about this mm. virus. You know, he's, he's stoking the flames. And you just go, they're lying to us the whole time. Yeah. Underreported it at the uh, outbreak. They're only concerned with the propaganda that's coming out of it. Uh, we're in a national crisis. We kind of need to know what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Oh, I, t- Trump's exactly right in a sense because uh, people are dying because of what China's done. People in Australia, people in America, people are dying because of that. I would say he shouldn't be calling it China virus. He should be calling it the communist virus because this only happened because of communism. People have to remember that. The, the What's it called? The Little Black Book estimated 100 million people died because of communism in the 20th century or whatever it is. You have to add these deaths to that number because the only reason this, this never would have happened... Ooh, knock my microphone again. This never would have happened in a liberal democracy. Uh, they never would have lied about it. Never would have happened to the same extent. People are lying. Our economy is getting wrecked. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their homes. People are dying because of communism. And you should be calling it the communist virus. There we go. All right. Uh, let's end that there and then go over to heroes and villains. Uh, yeah. So I think if we have a V, this is where the Grunt the Pig sound effect would come in. <laughs> the Grunt the Pig sound effect. They've already got a pig on the screen, mate. <laughs> we got two of them. <laughs> uh, so the Grunt the Pig freedom sna- snort. Uh, these are people that are set up for freedom and liberty and good things around the world. So Pete, hit us with your hero of the week. Well, my hero is a bloke called Scott Harris from Purcellville, Virginia. I think that's how you pronounce it. He's the co-founder of the Catuctin Creek Distillery. Distillery. Uh, if I could give you one piece of business advice, it would be make his business name easier to pronounce. But, you know, I'm no expert. Uh, anyway, Scott Harris has been providing hospitals. So he's, he's a distillery, right? So he's been providing hospitals, police departments, and emergency response stations with alcohol so that they can make hand sanitizer. He's been converting 55 gallons of disposable alcohol into hand sanitizer, and he's ordered another 1,000 gallons from his supplier. What a great fella. He said he felt like he had a moral responsibility to step up. Apparently, more than 557 distillers have volunteered to switch some of their production to hand sanitizer, so it's fantastic to see these uh, the free market coming to the party. Now, Congress, for their part, has done its bit to help distilleries by waiving the federal excise tax on dis- on drinkable distilled spirits, which is apparently 13 bucks 50 per gallon. Uh, but there's a hiccup. The law requires distillers to continue to follow the FDA rules to get the waiver. The federal, what's that? What's FDA stand for? Uh, the Federal Drug Administration. Oh, geez. As I asked that, I was like, why are you asking this? Bolt won't know. But you came through. Good stuff. Uh, so, but, so I googled these regulations, right, to see what they were about. There was 11 pages and it was a guidance document called Policy for Temporary Compounding of Certain Alcohol-Based Hand Sanitizer Products During the Public Health Emergency Immediately in Effect Guidance for Industry. So obviously you didn't read the whole thing, but there was even labeling laws and things like that. So these people, these gin makers who are helping the effort against coronavirus have to do labeling to help them help out everyone else 
So another example of how we have to cut red tape at all times. But this is a hero. So Scott Harris, you're my hero. And the other distilleries. Yeah, it's one of those like, are we the baddie moments where if you're stopping the vital supply of alcohol to a hospital because of mm. regulations, you might yeah. be the bad guy. Yeah, exactly. This is this hopefully will be a little fun for the listeners at home uh, and a bit of life producing, if you will. But so uh, this backup microphone that I'm recording into seems to have shut off. Is that bad? Yeah. Hey, how you going? It turned off. Yeah. yeah uh, off like they that. want to see your face. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Do, you, do you know? Do you know when it turned off? Did you see? No, it? I just saw it, and I think it's turned off. There should be spare batteries. Sweet. So let's just uh, get on to your just yeah. Get onto your hero. Yeah. Okay, my hero of the week is... All right, so in this crisis, I am watching a whole lot of Sky News. Like when I'm sitting at my you know, work desk at home, I've got the TV in the background. It's constantly giving me news updates. Mostly terrifying, but uh, you want to keep informed at a time like this. We are cultural commentators, are we not, Peter? Uh, <laughs> so something that Barely. usually happens in the morning is they'll cut to whatever Trump's press conference of the day is like around this time. Actually, I think like he was just about to take the podium when we started recording. Uh, now on, uh, a few days ago, right. Trump was joined by this guy, Mike Lindell, who's the CEO of a company called my pillow, which is like this, you know, late night infomercial for pillows. You know, have you, can you, is this ever happened to you or can you imagine what life would be like with a better pillow? That kind of vibe. Could you do that again, please? Absolutely not. So Mike Lindell and my pillow have converted their whole business to making 50,000 masks for healthcare workers. Right. Yeah. And I was like, what a guy. Great example of the altruism that comes out of free market capitalism. Great example of someone going, all right, this is not uh, This is something we can do to help out in a crisis. Awesome. And then I didn't think anything more of it. But apparently that's bad, Pete, because Mike mm. Lindell is a Republican. He is considering running for governor of Minnesota as a Republican. And he's also a friend of Trump. And also he's a guy who's a late night infomercial host and he's got, a, uh, got invited to a White House press briefing. Apparently that's all bad. Now, and people were attacking him going like, how, how is this guy allowed up there? This guy's a Republican stooge. This guy's doing like that. Now, you can say stuff like, isn't it a weird timeline where President Trump is joined by an infomercial guy at a White House press briefing to brief us all on coronavirus? Like imagine showing yourself that, to you, showing this headline to yourself four months ago or, or like four years ago. I get mm. that. But the stuff like, oh, this doesn't deserve to happen. It's like, everyone that gets to attack this guy needs to physically produce a document showing how many masks they've made for healthcare workers. And then we can decide whether or not we're going to listen to you attack this guy. That's exactly right. Who were those people like journos and stuff like that? Twitter. Journos. Yeah. Twitter. Like the blue check mark brigade. So usual suspects kind of thing, but it's just like the guys, the guys making 50,000 health masks. All right. He can, yeah. he can go up in a white ass press briefing. I genuinely don't care what his politics are when he's doing something like that. Exactly right. It's like, oh, what? So he can't have Republicans in his conferences when he is a Republican? Exactly. Give me a spot. Sorry, I'm just now terrified about this uh, recording. No, we're still recording, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> that will make absolutely no sense to people, uh, depending on how we cut the show. But let's move over to, we're up to villains. Sorry. Uh, exactly Pete, right. Talk us through the villains. Well, as we know, the uh, Extinction Rebellion back in October had a fake nudie run to save the planet. Here it is. As Extinction Rebellion protests enter their sixth day. Now, that is an absolute disgrace. That's not a real nudie run. Because of that, we call the Villain of the Week the Extinction Rebellion Fake Nudie Run Villain of the Week Award. James, who is your villain this week? All right, my villain is Dr. Bruce Aylward, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, but he's a Canadian physician and epidemiologist and assistant director at the World Health Organization. Now, the World Health Organization, these are the people that need to be very objective right now. They need to be very clear spoken right now. We need everyone to trust them right now. We're in a global yeah. pandemic. So when they pull crap like this, oh. everyone loses everything, right? So Bruce Aylward is getting interviewed by uh, RTHK, uh, which is a TV station over in Hong Kong. The reporter's Yvonne Tong. Now, uh, she wants to know about Taiwan. So, fun fact about Taiwan. Taiwan, obviously, very close to China. A lot of uh, 
passengers to and from the Chinese mainland, right? Now, in the yep. middle of this pandemic, there are just over 300 cases of coronavirus from the entire population, and only two people have died. Now, we talked about before about Sweden's approach to coronavirus and how we're going to have to look through the rubble after this is all done and figure out if Sweden had it right. I reckon Taiwan, whatever they're doing, is pretty good. If it's only mm. 302 deaths, that's a pretty good reaction. Mm. I want to know a bit more about what Taiwan's doing. So does Yvonne. So Yvonne asks him... Uh, if the WHO would reconsider Taiwan's membership in the WHO because the WHO uh, don't have Taiwan in there, just so they can have Taiwan in the room to figure out whether or not uh, we, we should be doing what Taiwan's doing. Now, Aylward didn't respond for several seconds and then said he couldn't hear the question. So Tang, Tong offered to repeat it, but he cut in, no, that's okay, let's move on to another question then. And she goes, no, I'm actually curious to talk about Taiwan. Aylward then appeared to either hang up the call or get disconnected. They call him back, and Tong asked if he could comment on how Taiwan has done in, so far in terms of containing the virus, and his response be, well, they've, I've already talked about China. Sure, that's not Taiwan, though. <laughs> they are absolute scum, those people. Like, how can you, yeah. in this time, you're there, you get all this money, and you're going to try and get more money in the future to, to save mm -hmm. us from pandemics, and you play politics with China... Yep. rather than actually do the right thing by the 7 billion people on this planet who pay your wages. Bruce, you are absolute scum. And the, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I'd, sorry. I've got nothing else to yeah, add to that. No, fair enough. There's nothing more to add. Like, this is not the time for one or two China policies. We're in a global yep. pandemic and we need to listen to the WHO. I want to bring you back. Uh, this is another thing I didn't send you, but Richard Alwood's got form in this area. Uh, he okay. led a WHO mission to Wuhan several weeks after the pandemic started. After returning, he told the media the country had absolutely turned it around. And then he said, in a clip shared by Chinese media, Alwood said the country knew what it was doing and, quote, if I had COVID-19, I'd want to be treated in China. That is I mean, of course, is he, of course he would if you were Aylward because you'd want to be treated in a country that needs you to propagate their propaganda. So, of course you want to be treated there. You're going to get the best healthcare in the world. Yeah, but is he going to be one of those people that got barred into their apartments so that they didn't spread, left there to starve and die and or dragged away from their apartments in the middle of the night and put in concentration camps? Well, I'm sure Alwood would have liked to stay in his penthouse apartment in the middle of Shanghai with, you know, all these things that the Chinese government would probably be buying him because that is out of control. I, I saw that vid interview and I was like, this bloke is the absolute worst of all the things we talk about. He's the, just the swampiest swamp creature you can imagine who probably goes to parties and says, oh, you know, I work for the World Health Organization and people are like, oh, what a great guy helping health around the world. Mate, you are... People will look back on this crisis and say, you failed us exactly all right uh hit us with your villain pete okay i will this one's actually this person's way less worse than that guy um <laughs> so john roscoe he's not the villain by the way john you're not the villain good john roscoe <laughs> had a piece in the fin on march 24 it was an excellent piece really made a lot of waves in australia it was called uh what was it called it was about the lollipop economy the, the key quote was the lollipop economy is over. Not in our lifetime will a worker ever again be paid 180 grand a year to stand and hold a traffic sign at a construction site, which apparently happens at some places in Queensland. Now, that was March 24. On March 26, Louise Van Ristel, the exec... I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Louise, was the executive, exec executive officer of Traffic Management Association of Australia, James, wrote into the Fin Review to rebut John's uh, article... She said, while the sensationalist journalism in John Roskam's virus crisis signals end of the road for the lollipop economy suggests a disproportionate wage to that of the broader community, that is confined to a narrow spectrum of projects covered by very specific uh, agreements and is not representative of our wider industry. And then she goes on to say, most importantly, we would ask that you reconsider your use of the term lollipop in future articles. Did that feel good, Louise? Did that feel good? You know, standing up for people saying lollipop. So, and I've got a few points to make about this, James. Firstly, Louise, this is not the time for this kind of stuff. It's not the time for talking about whether or not we should be saying lollipop or not. Secondly, I think Louise is like the talking clock and candlestick in Beauty and the Beast, who what a probably, reference. Doesn't, have, who what probably a reference. doesn't have that much to do. But when Belle turns up from the forest... They're like, finally, we've got someone to serve. And they sing that song, <laughs> Be Our Guest. That's what Louise was singing when she read John's article because finally she had something to do. She could write into the paper and say, stop using the term lollipop and not all of us get paid 180K a year. 
Good on you, Louise. Uh, and the final point I'd like to make about this, and the, the members of whatever they're called have to have to think about this. John's article went out on March 24. Louise's art, uh, letter back, March 26. Two days to write 200 words. Come on, Louise. <laughs> you should have been able to pump that out in half an hour, get it straight in there, and straight onto the Fin Review website. Two days is in too long for that piece. In her defence, that is showing a remarkable uh, keeping up with the traditions of the public service. Well, yeah, exactly right. They're just one of these... I was about to say a naughty word then. It's about one of these stupid uh, peak industry bodies. Absolute. They're sort yeah. of that semi-swamp that we talk about. Yeah, like semi-swamp. 42 people read the 200 words and had their input over what should be in and what should be out. Yeah, exactly right. They called... In Britain have a good name for them, which I think we should adopt here in Australia, called Quangos or maybe Quangos. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but we should do that. Well, I'll come back to us it. when you can pronounce it right. Okay, well, I'm going to get on to Kurt who, who, and Daniel Wilde who write those reports about the swamp and tell them to get that going because I reckon it's a winner. All right, sweet. Uh, now, let's go to... Uh, we caught up with the University of Wollongong campus coordinator here at the IPA, Boston Edwards, for his top three tips uh, yeah. on how to get through uh, a lockdown because he just came out of self-isolation, which uh, the whole concept of which terrifies me. I'm not cut out for self-isolation and I want to learn more about it. Just the voices start to come in. You know, yeah. louder oh, and louder. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a great chat, so have a listen. Okay, we're now joined by IPA campus coordinator Boston Edwards from the University of Wollongong. Boston, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Hi, James. Hi, Pete. How are you going? Very good. Oh, I'm going. Just oh, off- sorry. Oh, there we go. This is going to be something <laughs> we're going to have to figure out as we go oh, across. I just wanted to say it's great to have Big Bad Boston back on the show. Oh, yeah, it's been too long. It has been too long. <laughs> it has been too long. All right, so a few barbs there, but we'll keep going. Uh, so, Boston, yeah. you were saying off air that you were just coming out of self isolation. So, what's the story there? So, I was in contact with somebody who tested positive for COVID nineteen, and oh, I got contact you know. last week. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I got contact <laughs> last week, and my friend said that I needed to self isolate. So, it turns out that I don't have it. So I came out of isolation on Sunday. I'm still self-isolating because that's what the government's saying to do to keep your distance from everyone. But <laughs> I can go and yeah. get groceries, get my wine. <laughs> Two bottles ah. at a time, Boston. No, uh, there's no limit there. We're recording this. <laughs> we are, oh, we are, so, no. Sorry, we're recording this at, uh, in the afternoon just in case anyone was wondering if it was like in the morning in Boston it was an alcoholic. That's not the case. So, uh, yeah. No, what the funny story is, so we're recording on um, April the 1st, right? Yeah. And this morning my stepdad called my mother to say, oh, the bottle are closing at 12 p.m. tonight. And I just heard my mum go off and she ran out of her office screaming boston we've got to get down to the bowl like boston we've got to <laughs> stock up on wine and stuff and there's me freaking out and we, we drove down to the bottle like i bought some wine and the thing is i don't even drink that much and yeah. i'm panic buying wine this there's something going wrong with this but that turned that's out to be an april fool's joke sorry that turned out to be an april fool's joke it did didn't it it did yep so there you go. I've got some laughs out of it. Some people call it uh, hoarding. I call it Friday night. Sorry, Boston. Uh, you're here to give us an idea of what to do. So you're a guy that's just come out of self-isolation. Now, I'm struggling enough with just what to do under the Victorian government restrictions. I can't imagine what it's like in actual self-isolation. So what are the top things that you've figured out we need yeah. to be doing and how to pass the time in times of self-isolation? Guide us. Look, I struggle too because I'm a very social person. I'm always out and about. I'm never at home. So I had to learn on the job per se. And I also asked my friends about some of their tips. So my first tip is when you get up, make your bed and have a shower and get changed. Like add some normality to your routine during the day so you feel like you're like just going out about your day instead of being stuck in self-isolation. Don't wear your pyjamas because that's disgusting. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just very, to wear at night to sleep, nothing else. Very Jordan Peterson of you, uh, Boston, to tell people to make their beds straight away. And I'll be honest, I've never really watched Jordan Peterson before. I keep, wow. people keep on telling me that and I just haven't. So I need to. So Maybe what time are we getting goals. up, Boston? I'm getting up at 8 o'clock each morning. Wow. 
Well, hey. No, uh, no change in the schedule at all. No, pretty late for me. <laughs> I sometimes have to get up at 5.30, 6 a.m. for work, so... There you go. Well, Bolt told us last week that actually he was wearing his full like chinos and work shirt into the kitchen to do his to do his work from home. So very good stuff. I've what about number that. two? You've been... <laughs> okay, so standards have already that. started to drop. Yeah, the standards have started to drop. But what it was for me, so I get like I'm I'm not going back to you know sweatpants and pajamas and stuff like that. Sweatpants, but cool. I am uh, just sort of in standard gear because I just found if I was dressing up like full suit. And you're working, and then when you stop working, because like you know, there's a lot of things that sort of get put on the back burner, or you know, Pete and I have jobs which really require us being in an office, and when we're not in an office, it's just harder to do things. So I would be sitting in my full suit at my kitchen table, like not working, then getting anxious about not working, then that makes me work even less, and it was just like this negative feedback loop. So now that I'm back in casual gear, that's working better for me. So check in with yourself is what I would say to people <laughs> listening at home. Check in with yourself. That was a tip for free. Figure what works, <laughs> well, figure out what works best for you and how you can replicate that. Yes, exactly. Right, oh, Boston. Give us number two. Number two. I don't have a set list. So <laughs> number two Number two is um, study. So if you're lucky enough that your university is still operating somehow, make sure you're doing your study. Make sure you're catching up on your education because... That is important. We still need our doctors, lawyers, um, creative artists to entertain us and all that after this is all over. So keep on studying, even though I haven't studied at all. And I just found out I have an assignment due next Monday, which is 800 words long. So I'm going to have to start doing that. 800 words. What are you studying, Boston? Law and arts, double majoring in journalism and politics. Oh, what a combo. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Pete, do you have this. anything that you're learning about in this, you know, oh wait, you, how is the PhD going? I forgot. That was well, not... <laughs> that's a very, very good question, James, because I have been catching up on that as I've been telling the listeners, but a, a version of that is now sitting in my supervisor's inbox. So oh, he there can we look go. That whenever he wants. And I'm sure Huge. he doesn't listen to the Young IPA podcast, but I'm pretty sure his son does. So Saxon, if you're listening, just give him give a nudge. your old man a little nudge. <laughs> It's been a while. Thanks, mate. I didn't know you were smart, Peter. Oh, well. I, I Tell him the full story. Boston. I can't believe you're doing a PhD. Oh, they literally let anyone do a PhD these days, mate. So uh, there you go. That's why I'm doing it. No, uh, it's great stuff. It's going to be really good. Once it's well, well done. I hope you smash it. Yeah, thanks, mate. I've I'm been really learning. It's a long term, long project. So I'm glad I started doing a PhD, but that's all right. Yeah, I've decided to learn about the French Revolution in this time. Read a book about it. I'll say it. They went too far. <laughs> I'll say it. Which parts? Which parts? What are you referring to? I'd say to? the terror. I'd say the terror. The terror was the part where I'm just like, things Things aren't good here. This is not how just you do things. Went, it, went around it the wrong way. Yeah. Just not not a great time in history. All right, Boston, hit us with another one. So my third suggestion is to catch up on your Netflix and your Stan, your Disney Plus. Here we go. Your, yada, yada, yeah, yada. This is, this is something speaking to my heart. So if so, I'm currently watching a series that I'm loving. And if you're a, hist- if you're a history nut, if you're a fan of modern history, it's called Babylon Berlin. So it's a German neo-noir um, TV series. And it's based in 1920s Weimar Republic Berlin. And it centres around a homicide police detective and a lady of the night who joins in his escapades so you may say and it's it just shows you the interesting dynamics between the communists the fascists and the social democrats as well so the politics of it all is sort of like a side story but it's just a very interesting sort of series to watch it's in german and i'd recommend you watch it in the german um the original german and have english subtitles because the english dubbing is just shit okay no, you can say it. You can say it. You can speak your truth. Uh, <laughs> what I, uh, we gave up on that a long time ago. In, in <laughs> the spirit of speaking your truths, I tried to watch Babylon Berlin last year, and I'll say it kind of stunk. Did it? First couple of episodes, very slow. It like, gets you say how- so much better. Okay, good. Because you, know, you say how there's like a detective and the Lady of the Night that start to team up to solve a case. Like It took them four episodes to you know, fall into a partnership. And I'm like, you got to have the best story. Nah, you got, that's the end of the first episode. It's one of them looking at like, are we in? We're in. 
first episode. I'm watching Tiger King. That is electric TV. I've been told to watch it. Watch it. We need to get these people on the podcast. It is a documentary where, you know, I'm not going to spoil it. It is a documentary where you'll end the show hating literally everyone involved. Well, maybe not some of the side characters, but definitely every principal actor is a reprehensible person. Pete, what are you watching? Uh, I'm not really watching anything. I was watching the Second World War, War in Colour thing, which is which has been pretty good. But I, I do see that thing Boston's talking about all the time. I always flick straight past it, so I might check it out. Uh, I think you'd like good it. To, yeah, well, potentially. I don't mind that. Um, what's it called again? Something like... Weimar noir. Republic. No. Or film noir. <laughs> we, just, we just picked one thing and went with that. Yeah, no... Um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's good to have a bit of politics and um, uh, and history going on alongside the story. So that's um, that's a good thing. I recommend. So I've got another tip. This came in from a good friend of mine. So you know those Instagram, Facebook things where you set a challenge to your friends and they had to answer and if you get it wrong, you have to post yeah. it? Yeah. Well, my friend did one of them and a boy messaged her and gave her his answer. Uh-oh. And then all, and then he asked her out on a date. So you can actually. <laughs> I hope they're not mine. Victorian. I hope they're not Victorian. I uh, know they're New South Wales. Okay, so, so it's still so okay your tip to do is, that. Boston's tip is to slide into someone's DMs during the quarantine. <laughs> not necessarily, but like, you can still go about dating and stuff. Like, I don't <laughs> date. I'm alone. But uh, <laughs> again, you can't if you're in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> but like, still online, and you can do it over the whatever we're on zoom and Skype or you can wait until the end and have a drinks and celebrate your coming out of isolation. Yeah. That can, is the one thing really... keeping me going. The one thing keeping me, keeping my spirits high is just how what? electric nights out are going to be at the end of all this. Like there oh, is going to okay. be a month of just, uh, I will be drinking every night. I'll be going out every night. I will never take it granted for again, just a quiet night at the pub with mates. We are like, well, this is okay. Now it's going to be the best thing in the world. And that's the you thing. Took that, you go, Peter. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, Bolt took that in a slightly different direction than what I thought he was going to take it in. And I'm glad that he did. Uh, also, going back to sport and footy and things like that, like how good's the first game going to be that people are actually allowed to attend? It's just going to be one I of the I would walk to events. Gold Coast Fremantle. I would walk there. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So what were you going to say, Boston? No, the serious thing is that we've got to remain optimistic and we've got so much to look forward to after this is all over. We can catch up with friends, we can go for coffees, we can go out partying at night, we can drink ourselves silly at the pub. Like, there's a lot of things to look forward to after this all ends, so we've got to keep optimistic, I guess. Positive visualisation. You can still drink while you're in isolation. (laughs) Yeah, and that usually makes me more positive. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point. And you can um, you can drink while on podcasts to lots of people. So that's that's. The, I reckon I like the way Boston's take this. What have, what have we never yeah, done? Boston, this Boston's got it all figured out. I do. Maybe I should take over the IPA podcast. Oh look, or yeah. just the IPA in general. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it'll be the best. Uncle Boston's <laughs> weekly segment. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Uh, so Boston, if those are your tips, I just want to ask Pete if he's got any tips as well. While we're all sharing tips, quest without notice. Tips, but yeah, no, you... good one. Uh, I haven't got any tips. How are you feeling like your to, days? Well, I'm working hard, working hard for the people of the members and supporters of the IPA. But I think a key thing to do is because my, my houseboat actually works and he's still going to work because he works at a hospital. So he's not on isolation. So I am by myself a lot. Uh, I think that what you should do is still do activities with the people that you live with. So like rather than, so Boston's got this series, he's just recommended rather than me just sitting in my room watching that, I would sit with my housemate and watch it with him because he just hates everything. So he'll just go, this is crap and I'll pretend that I like it and it'll be just great <laughs> banter. Another thing you can do is you can play board games or games. So my parents and I were playing, is it Uno or Uno? We're yeah, doing one you know. game per day and we're keeping score. So I'm winning so far, obviously. But yeah. that's another suggestion. How does your family yeah. play Uno? Because uh, Uno have come out and said, yeah, Uno, Uno have come out and said you can't multiply plus, plus fours and plus twos. Now, in my childhood, if you cop a plus 18, that's just an important part of growing up. That's learning yeah. to deal with, resi- uh, uh, that's learning resilience and how to deal with setbacks. So yeah. you're, a, you're a multiplier. 
all I'm going to say is don't tread on me, Uno. I can set my own rules when I play Uno. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's go. Uno. I yeah. own the Uno. <laughs> Give it to big Uno, Boston. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> nice one. So, I guess if anyone wants to slide into Boston's DMs, go ahead. Yeah, I think that was what the call was. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. <All> right. <laughs> Give, yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, my last tip before we're all going around Tyson Fury, the heavyweight champion, is hosting these Instagram live aerobics classes with his wife. All free. They are electric. You get this big English gypsy just screaming at you to start doing push-ups every morning. Electric, get involved. They're a lot of fun. I think James met Traveller, but... Yeah. Who exercises? Uh, <laughs> all right, look at <laughs> PC Pete over here. All right, uh, Boston University... <laughs> University of Wollongong Campus Coordinator Boston Thank you so much And I will say He does call himself The Gypsy King So it's alright <laughs> Thank you so much You two yeah, Thank you too Boston Edwards I feel more comfortable Coming into My eventual Self-isolation Peter how do you feel oh, After that I feel like I've got the skills Necessary to lock Lock it down For a long time That was great Boston Thank you for helping out The young people of Australia yeah, by the way, we recorded that yesterday. I made a reference to Tyson Fury's uh, aerobics classes. I did one. Okay. I woke up this morning. Everything hurts. Ev- I thought like, you... <laughs> everything hurts. I thought you were looking nice and lean. That one I, session I... really started to... Well, I've been walking 12 k's a day for like a week and a half oh, now, which okay. is one of the reasons I'm not looking forward to self-isolation because that is my one thing holding myself back from pure insanity. So... I need those to stay in my life. So Tyson Fury is going to have to really pick up the slack if I go into full self-isolation. But we're getting distracted, Peter, because we want to talk I think about... Sh- I want to get a bit more distracted. Can you give the people of Australia a bit of the aerobics for the for the people watching on YouTube? <laughs> I, I don't have a whole lot of room to work with here. Uh, you? But if, if you can imagine me doing 10 push-ups, then 10 crunches, then 10 split jumps is a word I've learned. And I think that's the source of many of my aches and pains this morning because that's just not a... Uh, body movement I'm used to. You actually uh, gave that more than I thought you would. I thought you'd just say no. Pete, <laughs> I'm, I'm here to help, all right? It's improv. It's yes and. Now, okay. let's talk uh, the brothers. The brothers Cuomo. Cuomo. So you reckon they're called Cuomo? Yeah. Chris Cuomo and Andrew Cuomo. Oh, sorry. My housemate just got up. G'day, mate. Sorry. He's just, just trying got to up. sleep. He's trying to sleep. Well, he's been working hard, but he's, he's been trying to sleep and he's got me bellowing into a microphone about five yeah. metres from where his head is. Anyway... <laughs> Uh, what's his name? What is this bloke's name? Andrew Cuomo. Your house, mate. Cuomo. No, no. Cuomo is the governor of New York, right, which has 20 million people. And his brother, who is actually 12 years younger than him, his brother's 49, Andrew's 62. His brother is a CNN journalist. And the reason I mentioned their age, age and the size of the state in which this bloke is in charge of is because these two had the pettiest, uh, silliest, brotherly sibling tiff on live television just the other day. Now, there's, there's like five minutes of this stuff and it's all gold, but I'm going to play two little bits. So I'll play the first one. Mom shares her secrets about how to make sauce. Very few people. I mean, you shouldn't criticize yourself that you're not one of the people that mom saw as worthy to, you know, teach how to cook and make tomato sauce. Well, look, I, I'm sure she would have. It's just that you spent so much more time in the kitchen, Chris, than I did. Uh, you were just available to her. You know, you had that, uh, that uh, always like mom's little helper in the kitchen. I really respect that. So I think that because you were there and uh, always underfoot. Yeah, see, I don't see it that way. How many, I mean, I don't see years that. in the kitchen when you're big of it. So that is amazing stuff. Basically, the bloke is saying, mom loves me more than you because... I, she taught me how to make her secret tomato sauce and the other guy is saying, well, that's because, you know, you were, uh, you were mummy's little boy and I had to work. This is two great men with very important jobs. Then it goes on to this bit. I'm in my basement. Where are you physically? <laughs> I'm in, oh, my I'm in your basement. basement. That's what I just said. Yeah, that's where I am. <laughs> well, you spend yeah. a lot of time there, right? Christina says she sends you there a lot. So kitchen and basement, that's where you spend the time. One of them, the third most likely, according to sports bets, become the next president of the United States now. That's exactly right. That's the point I had to mention. This governor, right, because he, he's been doing really well in the face of the coronavirus, he's been touted as maybe a presidential hope. And even Trump's mentioned him and said this guy's doing well or something. Uh, so that's why he's talking to him. And I, and I don't know. I'd, I would like to get your opinion on who won that, James, because, you know, what, what do you think? I've got my opinion, but I'll let you go first. Oh, I think it's clearly Andrew. Just a good no 
one word no just alphas anyone like if you're able to deliver the word no uh, and just say it and you don't have to justify anything else yeah n- there's no coming back from it yeah i didn't actually show that bit but that's the bit where the first part of the video which is when he asks him are you trying to are you trying get a try and be president and he goes no and then he goes will you think about it in the future and he goes no and he goes how do you know what you'll think in the future and he goes because i know so as yeah, i said yeah. there's heaps of that stuff to check out but he also he also oh, right. says he calls on, goes on to call him an arm. So the governor goes on to call the journalist an armchair general, saying only he works one hour a day. And as I said, the younger guy says, "Well, Mum loves me more. She taught me how to use the tomato sauce." I would say that definitely the older guy won. You can tell the younger one. It's just classic older brother to little brother. You know, the younger one's getting yep. a bit head up. He's getting a bit angry, and the older guy's, "Well, you know, I'm governor of New York, 20 million people. You're a journo. Governor's probably yeah. a higher position." And, uh, yeah. and the other part is uh, Chris, the younger brother, Chris Cuomo, the CNN host, is the reason we can't say Fredo anymore, if anyone remembers that story. This was a guy that got called a Fredo on the streets in New York and flipped out saying that's a, that's an offensive term to Italians. So he stopped us from saying the word Fredo. Uh, I think I'm now starting to see why we can't say the word Fredo is because he's clearly the Fredo of his family and he does not like that word being said around him. What is, I have, I've, as I said, I've, I have no idea what that word is. I've never heard it before. Talk me Pete, through. What, genuinely, that. talk me through your days. Like, what, from from your waking moment to when you fall asleep, what do you get up to? I could guarantee, mate, that like ninety five percent of our listeners won't have heard the word Fredo. It's clearly an American I think slang a word. Fair few more people have seen The Godfather, where this comes from, than you. Oh, imagine. it's in The Godfather. It's in The yeah. Godfather. Because what does it mean? Like. The family's got this piece of, uh, you know, this piece of work, younger brother called Fredo, who contributes yeah. nothing to the family and just starts cavorting around Cuba with, you know, his floozies and stuff and ends up like betraying the family just to get out of a debt or whatever it was. But it's basically like uh, another way of saying black sheep of the family. And the oh, reason we can't that... say Fredo is because he's Chris, he's the Fredo. That is a bit You like are the Fredo of this podcast. Why would you refer to all Italians as that? That is a You bit are the Fredo of this podcast. You've added yourself. Anyway. You are the Fredo. Uh, the other right, thing he says, uh, which I'm not sure is in there, is he goes, you know, your wife sends you down to the basement. That's why you're in the basement because he's in the basement. Anyway, great. Yeah, stuff. I should Check say, out. like, uh, we may find a Chris Cuomo, but he has come down with coronavirus. So, you know, kick its ass, Chris, and get back on TV so we can keep making fun of you. Didn't know that had happened. So, I did tell you that. <laughs> you did <laughs> not tell me. You. I you did not tell me. Wait, do you want to do the CNN thing on the thing right now? I, I will Lassie screenshot will. it. I will screenshot the messages I sent you. All right. The if other you, one I want to talk about. So, over in that, the UK, be- over in the UK, uh, public health experts never wanting to uh, lose their track record in the media. They wrote in the uh, British Medical Journal that cigarettes, uh, you know, well, cigarettes have those health warning labels put on them about what happens if you smoke. They wanted it extended to petrol pumps. Uh, basically, all the story you need to know. The thing is, the only good part for people who are suffering right now is how cheap the price of petrol is. And now these experts mm. want to come in and say, okay, you can't even enjoy that because we're going to ruin it for you by showing you all these sad photos of what happens when people emit things. Like, this is just choose a better time. Choose a better time. Choose it earlier. It's like this is very February 2020, this kind of stuff. They should have got yeah. the memo. Climate change doesn't exist anymore. Climate change is over. <laughs> no one cares about climate change. This is what a real crisis looks like. Everyone now yeah. knows that. These people should have got this in a month earlier because climate change is over. I've called it. It's over. My point with this is if, you, if we're doing warning labels on things, you've you got to go straight to bats. I want, to, yeah. I want warning labels on bats. Then we can move our way down to petrol pumps because bats are my number one problem right now. Or pangolins. What's the second one? Sorry? Pangolins or pangolins or whatever you pronounce it as. Oh, is that that other kind of... Yeah. 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 Plain packaging. Have you seen Plain a photo packaging. of them? What's that, mate? Have you seen a photo of them? A photo of a bat. A pangolin. <laughs> Oh, uh, I I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, Google Why? it right now because they permanently look like uh, they're trying to butt into a conversation but can't figure out the right time to do it. Everyone listening uh-huh. to this right now, Google it. They look like they're trying to butt into a conversation but they don't know the right time. They're permanently just like, ooh, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> I've just Googled that. Actually, the first thing that comes up is, was the pangolin the source of the COVID-19 outbreak 19 hours ago? So, yeah, let's plain package them as well. But I do see your point. They do look like they don't quite know what to say. 
Uh, now I've lost my notes about what we're going to say. Oh yeah, so yeah, look, not the bloody time. You're right. They should uh, they should label bats. Yeah, no. So my official rankings of things that need plant packaging are yeah. bats, then yeah. pangolins, then people's hands. So you, you know you get a warning label before we do handshakes. Uh, then if you come between six feet of someone when you're walking across, they're legally required to give you a warning label of themselves, and yeah. then it's petrol pumps. I don't think petrol pumps should be on that list because climate change doesn't exist anymore. Everyone's, it's over. It's over. All I've right. It. Uh, now, uh, I had one more segment, but it's not that good. So I'm going to skip it and end the show there. I want to know what it is now. Okay. So, all right. This might not pay off if it doesn't. I apologize to everyone. All right. Pete, here's what the New South Wales Police Force uh, put out this week to appeal to the kids. On Facebook, did a full 180, crazy, isolating all day at home, did the virus change me, maybe now I'm just using all the sani up, my hands clean already, all these germs, it's scary, got no plans of leaving at all, so if you don't want to see me hanging with somebody, if you want to believe that quarantine will stop me, don't show up, don't go out, don't start breaking your ISO now, stay at home, you know how, don't start breaking your ISO now. What is that? Well, it's... It's in this. It's in keeping with this broad range of things that police now do, which really annoys me. Which is they try and be funny on social media. Every single law enforcement service, someone did it once and it was funny, and now they all do it, and it drives me insane. New South Wales Police, yeah, stop strip searching children uh, and making rhymes about coronavirus. What song is that? Is it a song? I thought it might I have know. been S Club Seven. Not the way you sung it. It wasn't a song, but it could have. It, was, it had a that bit was beat of poetry. Um, Spice Girls. If you want to be, what's that called? Want to be? Had a bit of that about it. Maybe it's that. Let's find that out for next week, though. Pop, pop. No, I think it's uh, S Club Seven. Don't show up. Don't go out. Don't start breaking your ISO now. Stay at home. Do you know how? Don't start breaking. Oh no, because it doesn't have bring it all back to you. But that is good though. I like it more now that you sung it. Maybe I was wrong. Though I was into that. Yeah, I think it is S Club 7. Uh, I'm going to stick with that. If you know what it actually is, let us know. But I think it's S Club 7. All right. Okay. Uh, that is it for the show this week. Thank you to Boston Edwards. Thank you to yeah. Listening Home. Thank you to Saul, who's done so much work trying to set this all up. Must dealing be boy. with us two knuckleheads on technology. <laughs> Was I meant to press record, Saul? Yeah, don't joke about that because I've dropped out twice. Anyway, that is it for the show this week. See you guys next week. See ya.